Hello, everyone. It's 1 p.m. Let's try that again. Hello, everyone. It's 1 p.m. Eastern, and that mean it's means it's time for to begin our 80th Coco Ross Weather Talk webinar. A very warm welcome to all of you joining us today. I'm your host, meteorologist Henry Regis. Running the technical side of our program is our very own Noah Newman. We're coming to you live from what is ice cold Fort Collins, Colorado here today. For those of you who are unable to join us for our live broadcast, we are recording today's talk and it will be available later this week on our website. All of our Weather Talk webinars are sponsored by the generous donations from listeners just like you. Well, today's webinar will answer a question that many of you might have been wondering about. Can, can it can snowfall when temperatures are above freezing? You know, I've seen it snow here when it's in the 40s in Fort Collins, so this is an interesting question. Uh, we'll also learn about the, that and other intriguing weather phenomena, including mountain rain and snow, which is a citizen science program, uh, similar to Kokoros. We'll talk more about that. Uh, we're really happy to have with us as our guest today, Megan Collins. She's the Education Program Manager at uh, the Desert Research Institute in Reno, Nevada. Uh, Megan originally is from the Buffalo, New York area. She received her undergraduate degree from McGill University in Montreal and her master's from the University of Victoria in New Zealand, both of these in environmental science and with an emphasis in communication and policy. There are two dimensions to Megan's work. The first is to translate the results of DRI science outwardly, and the second is to create ways to involve people in DRI science. Megan's work is synergistic with scientists in many fields, and she looks for ways to elevate science and engage students and community members meaningfully in their work through internships, citizen science, and other immersive experiences. Her education and professional experience are interdisciplinary. She enjoys teaching at the community college level and is passionate about fostering a stronger culture of mentorship at her research institution. In her off time, Megan likes to participate in, in social dance. She likes to hike and enjoys many other outdoor activities. Well, let's give a big Coco Ross welcome to Megan Collins. Megan, it's great to have you with us today. Thank you so much, Henry. Hello, so everybody. as we start off, I usually pose this question to all of our guests, and that is, uh, how did you become interested in weather? Uh, maybe give us a little background on that. I love this question, Henry. Um, my One of my earliest, earliest memories was actually a first snowfall in the Buffalo, New York area. Um, many of you probably have memories of being a kid and experiencing the magic of a first snowfall of the season. Um, this particular memory involved uh, getting outfitted in a snowsuit, probably not unlike the one in the Christmas story where the kid is walking around like a starfish and cobbling together a snowman with my parents that was full of grass and dirt, but feeling so proud that we did that. Um, and so that is, that is probably where I got hooked. I was telling a friend the other day that that I, I do have an inner weather nerd that has been able to come out and express itself through these really fun um, citizen science projects, working with other people who are passionate about watching the weather, learning about weather. And I, um, I think Coco Ross was one of the first um, really large scale citizen science programs that I had the, the pleasure to um, encounter here in our region. So I, I appreciate all the work that you do as a community um, and the contributions you make to the weather field. Um, before I get go any further, I will share that um, my background, like Henry said, is broad environmental science and I specialize in science communication and do a lot with, um, with uh, to, to further education um, as part of the science community and so I come at this I come at this um, this talk with that experience. Well thanks Megan that's great. So if you want to go ahead and share your screen uh, I think there's a, the buttons on there somewhere um, we can we can begin there we go Thank and you. we'll we'll catch up with you at the end uh, and then we'll have some questions from our audience for you. Thanks. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so as Henry and Noah said, 
Um, today I'm going to be sharing a bit about the phenomenon of why it snows above freezing and um, illustrate that phenomenon in the context of the big scientific conundrum that this um, that the phenomenon creates. And we are trying to address this phenomenon with mountain rain or snow, bringing scientists and weather, weather watchers together to answer the question. So if you are, if you're able to use the little raise hand function, um, I would love to see kind of a show of hands of who actually has noticed this? It, it's likely to happen maybe in some regions, but not others. Maybe you've been driving and you're looking at the, you know, temperature sensor, the thermometer in your car and notice that it's above freezing and it's snowing or like this picture, maybe you have a, a thermometer in your house and look outside. Um, we're seeing 42 45 out of the 105 attendees up oh, we're up to 50 it's going up as we speak so yes lots of people have great so thank you noah yeah so it sounds like a lot of you have had this experience before um it is it is very common and for hydrologists and water managers it's not just interesting but it, like i said it actually creates a conundrum for making forecasts and other decisions around, um, around that weather. And to, to dig into this, I wanna explain another concept before we jump in and explain the phenomenon, which is this idea of precipitation phase. And precipitation phase refers to the phase state. If you go back to you know chemistry classes that you might've taken in high school or even earlier to describe water's state. Is it a solid or a liquid? And so understanding the change between those phases is really, really important for forecasters and meteorologists as well as hydrologists. We, we all have an innate understanding that an inch of snow is very different than an inch of rain. Um, and we, we hear from meteorologists uh, very frequently that um, predicting the actual transition, we often see a range, oh, snow levels will drop to 2,000 to 4,000 feet or 2,000 to 3,000 feet. And being able to really hone in on, um, on that prediction more accurately is, is part of the goal of what we're doing here. So let's, let's pan out first and think about that question. Why, just why does snow fall above freezing? Um, well, this phenomenon is, not a result of the change of the law of physics, right? We are still working within the, the physics and the, the chemistry principles that we've, we've known and loved for, for ages. Um, water consistently freezes at 32 degrees. But the short answer to this question of why snow falls above freezing is actually that snow that does form in and above freezing temperatures may simply not have melted before it reaches the ground. Now, if that simple answer doesn't quite scratch your itch to know more, let's dig into that. So I mentioned before that snow falls, or excuse me, snow forms at an elevation that's generally colder, um, colder than the, the layer that where we live and work. And as crystals fall through the atmosphere, um, if the atmosphere is warmer, it may simply melt and turn to rain. When it does not, it is because the rate of melting is slower than the time that the crystals took to fall to the ground. Okay, tell me more. Melt rates, and this is really the clincher and why we might see it in places like the Front Range or the Sierra Nevada or other arid climates, those melt rates depend in part on the humidity in the air. So to bring it back to what you may have experienced, um, this phenomenon, you can think of your body's own response to heat which is sweating, the molecules on your skin transfer heat from your body to the water cooling you down. So water is a great conductor of heat. When air is less humid, there are fewer water molecules in the air to transfer that heat energy to snow crystals to melt them. So they melt relatively slower than it would in a more humid place. So snow melts more slowly as it falls in dry climates and um, we often see this in mountains as well. 
and it may, um, and it just may be slower to melt before it reaches the ground. So you can see in this illustration, um, an example, a cascade range has higher humidity than the rain shadow of the Sierra Nevada. So we may see that rain snow transitioning, rain snow transition happening in two different, at two different elevations. So coming back to this question of improving winter precipitation phase, I explained explain the meaning of that to you already. Um, why, why do we, we talked about why um, forecasters and hydrologists care about this, but how can we actually address this question? Well, right now in weather models and actually in, in a lot of the technology that we use to observe um, precipitation phase, Sometimes there's an assumption that rain transitions to snow at just a simple zero degrees Celsius or 32 Fahrenheit. But as we all know and have experienced, or at least 50 of you have, snow can sometimes fall at higher temperatures. So how can we improve these estimates? Well, we need ground-based observations. So much like Coco Ross is making ground-based observations of how much precip falls, and Mping is making ground-based observations of the range of precipitation that falls, mountain rain or snow is making ground-based observations at precipitation phase, and we're really focusing on that, the greatest range of uncertainty, which is a little bit below freezing to a little bit above freezing or 40 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And these ground-based observations are gonna be used to ground truth some of the technology. And so this graphic just shows how observers like you and the, and I'll explain about how many people are involved in the program right now, um, are, making, are making much more accurate observations of what's actually falling from the sky right now. So I mentioned this temperature threshold. I mentioned that a lot of models will use a zero degree or 32 degree Fahrenheit um, temperature threshold, um, but this can throw our predictions off. And so by getting observations from a range of ecoregions or a range of a big climatic diversity, we can improve um, prove our ability to predict. And what we're actually building out, I'll show you in a minute, are probability curves that um, enable us to, to better understand the probability of rain versus snow in different hydroclimates for a range of temperatures. So this season, we received funding from NASA to expand our, to expand our work from the pilot area. We piloted this in the Sierra Nevada region, um, mainly around Lake Tahoe, but a, a little bit in the um, Eastern Sierra. And we also had uh, quite a few observations from the Great Basin. Um, and Desert Research Institute, Linker Technologies and University of Nevada, Reno um, received support from NASA to work on this issue so that ultimately we can improve NASA satellites like NASA GPM ability to understand this rain snow threshold. And so I explained how more mountains equals more um, climatic diversity. For those of you who are already like, all right, <laughs> sign me up. Um, this is the number where you can text you can find the keyword um, that corresponds to your region. So if you're in the Colorado region or if you're in the Northeast, you can use the appropriate keyword. Um, and I will talk about our preliminary data next, but I wanna just jump into um, to how people participate first. So when, we, when our team sees that there is a, um, an interesting storm, so a storm on the kind of in some of those warmer temperature ranges coming, we actually send an alert out by text to the people who have subscribed. And here you can see, this is just a simple um, graph showing the, the growth of our um, observer networks through this season. And um, so for each observer network, let's say that in the Lake Tahoe region, we know there's a, a warm atmospheric river coming and we're likely to see um, rain transitioning to snow sometime this afternoon. So I would send out a little alert to our Sierra Nevada list and just 
requesting that people keep their eyes on the sky with us this, this afternoon and evening. When people see rain, snow, or mixed precipitation falling, they then can open a web app and simply respond to the question, what is falling from the sky right now? Um, so they'll send us an observation of whether it's rain, snow, or mixed precipitation. If you've ever looked at something falling from the sky and you have to think about it for a second, it might be mixed precipitation. Mixed precipitation sometimes looks like a little bit um, crystallized rain or slightly wet, wet slushy snow. Um, and so that is, that is, so our large network of observers, there's about 800 right now, um, are answering that simple question, what is falling from the sky right now? When they do answer that question, we get obviously a timestamp for when they sent us that observation, as well as a geotag. So the, their phone will send the location along with their answer to that question to our database, and that enables us to populate maps like the one that I showed you earlier. So what are we doing? What have we seen so far this season? Well, one of the interesting things that we saw um, going from the fall into the winter is that we actually had um, a larger amount of rain kind of heading into December, which probably isn't a surprise for many of you, given that you, you know, that's still um, not a time of year that it snows. And then um, into December and January, snow quickly surpassed um, rain and mixed precip. At the time of this presentation, we've got um, snow outnumbering rainfall for, by about 2.4 to 1. Let's talk next about those, um, val the validation of the GPM satellites. So how is this work ultimately helping to improve estimates of precipitation phase. Well, all of the citizen science data is, is going to be validating some NASA products or NASA observations of rain and snow, um, ultimately improving the accuracy of these satellite estimates. That's why NASA's um, backing the project. And we're also using, in addition to satellite estimates of rain versus snow, we are also using satellite derived probability of snowfall by air temperature. And here you can see um, where the GPM success rate differs from our, our ground-based observations here. So this is just temperature from a little lower, a little colder than negative five Celsius all the way up to a little over 10 degrees Celsius. And the GPM performance. So up to certain temperatures, they're very similar. And then there's this um, divergence between their success rate and what we're seeing on the ground. So that's why ground-based observations are just so important. I also mentioned that we are building probability curves. This graph shows snowfall probability plotted against air temperature for two eco ranges. This is for 2020 and 2021. So um, this is from our pilot project. So not, not this current season, but the previous seasons for the Central Great Basin and the Sierra Nevada areas. And so at air temperatures near freezing, so you can see this um, y-axis here has, uh, again, a temperature range. For air temperatures near freezing, snowfall probability was near 100%. It probably wasn't a surprise. Um, and as as we got warmer, snowfall probability declined with increasing air temperature falling to zero. So this is probability on the y-axis falling to zero at about 10 degrees Celsius. Um, what the gray, this gray dashed line indicates is the line that um, corresponds to 50% snowfall probability. So at about 4.2 degrees Celsius, we see that there's about a 50% probability of snow in the Sierra Nevada, which is much, much warmer than the current default value um, that's used in, in some land surface models. Um, what we really appreciated about the pilot season, so 2020 and 2021, is that the majority of the precipitation phase resort uh, reports that were provided by our observers actually fell in the the rain snow temperature range of the highest uncertainty. <laughs> so we were really thrilled to, to be able to get this 
valuable information that's ultimately going to help us improve um, improve rain snow estimations. Megan, if if I could just interrupt real quickly, mm -hmm. any so some of our observers may not be familiar with this the uh, Celsius scale. Could you kind of convert those just off the top of your head into Fahrenheit? Because I think that's what a lot of folks might be more familiar with. Absolutely. So we're all we're all. Um, aware that zero degrees Celsius is 32 Fahrenheit. And I'm actually going to open a little temperature converter so I do not mislead you um, really quickly. So let's go. So we, have, we already know that um, zero and 32, zero degrees Fahrenheit is 32 Celsius. Um, I mentioned that 4.2 degrees Celsius was that 50% probability boundary, and that's about 39.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So in, in the Sierra Nevada where we are, there's a 50% chance of rain and a 50% chance of snow at 39.6 degrees Fahrenheit, which is, you know, it might strike you as high, but that's because we're in such an arid region. I mentioned that the probability of snow was all the way down at zero at 10 degrees Celsius. That's 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so that's kind of the range where the probability of rain is higher than snow. And um, the, the difference between these two curves is the Sierra Nevada is, is much higher elevation than um, in many places than the central Great Basin and range, but there's also a lot of elevation variability in both of those in both of those areas. So thank you, Henry, for pausing me. I will, um, I will try to translate um, as well as I can throughout. Awesome. So another quick recap of, or another kind of interesting tidbit that we, that we learned in 2020 and 2021 is that um, so this is really interesting. Um, between zero degrees and 30, or excuse me, 32 Fahrenheit and 39, approximately 39 Celsius, um, using a 32 degree Fahrenheit rain snow threshold would have misidentified 71.7% of the phase observations. They would have characterized them as snow when they were actually rain. Um, if, so that's at a, so if we assume that rain transitions to snow at 32 Fahrenheit or zero Celsius, we would have gotten it wrong over 70% of the time. Likewise, if we used a two degree, um, two degree Celsius threshold or a 35.6 degree threshold. So let's say that instead of assuming that rain transitions to snow at, um, at the you know freezing point 32 we assume that it it transitions at a little over 35 we're still leading to about a 60 percent rain versus snow misidentification rate so for our area we need to go even higher and the reason that we're looking at such hydroclimatic diversity is that so that we can identify the most appropriate threshold for each region So let's talk about, we've been talking about the, you know, the, the physical side. We've been talking about principles of physics and chemistry. Now let's talk about the human dimension of this project, um, which is the, the aspect that I'm actually leading. Um, one of the really unique things about this project I mentioned is the, the text message alert system. And this enables us to reach people in real time um, with alerts that are customized for their region. And not only are we reaching out to them, but at any point, if people wanna respond directly to that text message with a question um, or a concern, or even for technical troubleshooting, they, they reach me directly on the app on my phone and I can respond in real time as well. So this has, this has brought us together um, to help you know, troubleshoot to help answer questions. And it has been a really great way to build community as well. So 
like I, I mentioned, I just want to clarify that I send alerts out to every observer and then people aren't pinging. If they reply, they aren't pinging all of the other observers. We, they just pinged me directly. Um, so let's just look at this. So this was our 2021 season um, participation rates. And, and you can see on this graph that we've got a really high number of people who are, um, their most recent observation was very close to the day since the last notification or the alert that went out. Um, most of our observations are coming in very soon in proximity to when we send out those alerts, um, which is a, another way of saying that the alerts really work to keep people engaged and interested in the project. I also mentioned that we're looking at many, many different ecoregions. And one of the cool things that we track on a regular basis is the diversity of ecoregions from which observations take place. Now I know this font might be kind of small, but you can see that there are over 20, or excuse yeah, over 20 different ecoregions that um, just in the last few weeks. So this is a two week snapshot um, ending in on March 1st or 2nd. Um, so precipitation, we didn't have any in the Sierra Nevada, but we did have quite a bit in Colorado and in the Northeast, as well as throughout the Appalachian region here and some in the Pacific Northwest and the upper Rockies. So um, the Northeastern Highlands is kind of the, the winner here, as well as the Eastern Great Lake Lowlands. Um, and uh, as you can see, there were still quite a few spotty here and there observations from, from other places. So. Um, those, we're working on building out probability curves like I showed in the um, previous graphs for many different ecoregions. So coming back to how to participate, I mentioned that we have a web app. Um, a web app is an app that functions through the browser on your phone. This is a lot more nimble. Um, it means that no download is required. People, um, if they don't want to, they don't have to create a login. You can simply um, access it like you'd access any other website. Um, it also enables us to keep the app, the web app updated with a lot more um, agility than a what's called a native app or an app that you would need to download. So um, if you have already signed up, we, we really appreciate it. We would send you a series of three texts teaching you how to participate when you initially sign up. Those would include the address to the web app. If you prefer not to get text message alerts, but you still wanna participate, it's really easy to find. You just go to your web browser on your phone or wherever you would Google something and type in rainorsnow.app. So that's rainorsnow.app. And what you're gonna see is something that looks like this. So um, you will see a place to sign in or continue as a guest. We ask that location services be enabled. And that's how I just explained that it's a progressive web app. Um, and once you log in, you'll see something like this. What is falling from the sky right now? Send us updates in real time whenever it's raining, snowing, or a wintry mix. You can navigate using the tabs at the bottom. So this is this is submit where you would submit an observation. You can also track all the different reports that you have sent. It's a little bit about our program. And then um, if you want to update your profile, you can do it there. If you want to know more, um, at the end of January, we actually did an Ask Me Anything session um, where our whole team got together and spent an hour just answering questions from interested, um, from folks from our observer network. So you can just navigate, you can write down that short link, bit.ly, bit.ly forward slash mountain rain or snow. So M-R-O-S dash A-M-A. And that's another way to find out more about the project. Um, here's a recap on how to sign up. This is the wife and little boy of our project PI and they are out in, the, um, the woods in Vermont, taking some observations of rain on a really lovely day. Um, 
If you are in any of these other regions, um, we welcome you to sign up. I will note that the two at the bottom, Oregon, Rainer, Snow, and Great Basin are the smallest groups, and we are actively looking to grow our observer networks in those regions. So I welcome you to email me and share um, if you know if you know folks or know ways to spread the word in those two places. And last but certainly not least, I wanna thank the entire team. Um, like I mentioned before, Mountain Rain or Snow is a collaboration between Linker Tech, University of Nevada, Reno, and the Desert Research Institute. And we have folks in, in multiple different states and this is a, a really lovely team. I, I am thankful every day that I get to work with them. And um, at that point, I am happy to take questions. Well, thanks, Megan. Appreciate the, the informative information there. I've got one off the top of my head. What is the, what's the highest temperature you've seen where snow has fallen? So from all Ooh. these things, what, what is the, you know, I know there's thresholds, but is there, you know, a, yeah. a number that stands out in, in all the time you've done this? You know what? Not off the top of my head. I think that the, let me just click back now to that probability curve that I showed. I want to say that it was just under 10 degrees. Um, yeah, I want to say that it was close to, I'm going to use my little converter here again, close to eight or nine Celsius. Um, so again, well into the again, 40s. In, in Fahrenheit for the folks out there, that's. Yeah, well into the 40s. So low okay. 40s. Low 40s. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Really neat. Well, Megan, some... this, this is Noah. I want to actually ask you a quick question too on that map. Did, did you get someone from Albania or Greece or something? Yes. Yes, we have. <laughs> so this is, this is so, this is so, it's been so much fun to work with different collaborators. Like um, Noah was really kind and shared out our, our invitation to participate at the beginning. And we really grew our observer network through Coco Rust. NASA also helped us grow our observer network and NASA has um, a lot of really science, a lot of science enthusiasts all over the world. And there is somebody who's actually in Greece who has been sending us observations consistently. And we, you know, obviously we aspire to grow the project um, and, and provide this, this information as far and wide, wide as possible. And we're, we're really grateful that this person has been really consistent. And if you're out there, um, reach out to us. We would love to know who you are because we, we don't collect, you know, we don't collect identifiers on people. So if you're interested, um, reach out to us. We would love to know who that is and uh, celebrate you a little bit. <laughs> Megan, if you could put that slide back up with the phone number on there and leave yeah. that while we ask questions that people are asking for that right now. So that would be, that would be very helpful. In fact, I signed up while you were doing it and I already got a text back. So yes, <laughs> it worked pretty quickly. That, that's great. There we go. So one of the questions I'm getting, uh, a lot of folks have written in and wanted to know what about my state? So here's New Mexico, here's Ohio, here's Washington state, here's others. And if they're not in these regions, uh, can they participate or will they be able to in, in the future? That is a great question. I'm really glad that, that you all asked that. So as you can see, these keywords do target specific ecoregions where we're actively sending out alerts. Um, this is because of the, for, the, for the size of our team right now, this is what we can do in a way that's consistent and accurate. We welcome data from any location anywhere in the world including across the continental US and, and all of North America. Um, so for folks who already have their eyes on the sky, you are always welcome from New Mexico, from Ohio, from the Pacific Northwest, from you know, West Virginia. If you are in any of those places, we welcome data from you. We welcome your observations. Um, if NASA decides that they like us, we are going to be able to grow um, our capacity and expand the number of eco regions um, to include the Four Corners area, to include the, the Rocky Mountains, to include further, further into the Cascade regions. Um, and I'm blanking on I'm blanking on the other region that we've proposed, but we've targeted mountain regions, but we really, you know, I don't want I don't want it to be confused that 
just because we're targeting mountains doesn't mean you have to live on the top of a mountain to be able to subscribe. We need that whole elevation range to, to improve those, um, improve our, our estimates of the rain snow transition. So short answer is you can um, share data from anywhere. A lot of people will, um, they'll type in rain or snow dot app and then they will bookmark it on their phone. So it's really easy to find in the future. Um, so that's another way if, if you're not in a place where alerts are, are actively being provided, you can just simply bookmark it or even save it, um, save that progressive web app page as an icon on your screen. And so it's really easy. It, you can tap on that icon the same way you would tap a native app. Great. Uh, could you tell a little bit, uh, you may have, you did t speak quickly to this, uh, but uh, could you, uh, one of our observers wants to know what is, how is this different from NPing? So yeah. NPing looks for certain things. What, what's the difference between you guys? Yeah, that's a really great question. So um, much, so similarities between NPing and mountain rain or snow are that we are, we are both observing different types of precipitation and we are doing that using ground-based observation. The differences are in that mountain rain or snow is, is specifically targeting this one question, how do we improve the rain snow transition? And we are ultimately, MPing is working through NOAA to improve forecasting through NOAA's channels and the models that they use. And we are working to improve the, the models and the technology that NASA are using. Um, so in the, the long big picture scheme of things, we are working towards similar goals through different channels, trying to, to make a, a more kind of comprehensive approach on that. And our, we, we value the contribution that citizen, science make, citizen scientists make across all projects. So we fully support MPing and Coco Ross and, and all of the community snow observations, all the winter related observers out there who are who are helping scientists and really moving the needle on these big questions. Yeah, we've got a couple observers here. There's a person, Larry in Chicago says that it's snowing there at 35 degrees right now. And here's uh, Alex is in central Pennsylvania. They got one inch of snow yesterday with air temperature of 48 degrees. So, wow. yep, that's, uh, that's pretty, pretty good. We're seeing that. Um, Anne wants to know, and again, you may have given a, a number out, but is there a different text number for a region outside of the areas you're looking at here? So is this the same? So say somebody lives in Canada. How do they, how do they, when they text, what do they write into the, what's the keyword that goes into, into there for, for those outside these regions? Great question. Thank you for asking. So right now we have this, this is a toll-free number that, that is, U.S. based. It's the same toll-free, same number for any of the eco regions or the you know keywords that we have here. I have not actually inquired as to whether folks in Canada or Mexico could send a text toll-free to this number. That is a great question. We currently do not have um, eco regions in Canada. Like I mentioned, we welcome your observations. We just we don't have active alerts going out to those regions. Um, so, and if you provide your email, I would be very happy to look into the question of, can folks in Canada text this number at, you know, toll free the same as you would from, from a, a US state. And some folks are asking about when they sign up via the uh, the text they, they will get a link I noticed on mine to the to get the app so that that's what you use for the program is the app so just for you guys uh, typing those questions in there they will definitely send you in send you the uh, the information on the app yes, okay I'm put it in a few more questions, yeah. questions here and uh, Jackie was wondering can satellites distinguish between rain snow and verga they get a lot of verga in New Mexico on oh. And it doesn't reach the ground, but what? That's a good question. Uh, any information on that? You know, I do not know the answer to that question, Henry. Do you know? I I don't. I yeah. don't. We yeah. We, we can we can follow up with you. Maybe um, yeah. Maybe we can follow up with that and, and get back to you, Jackie, on that one. Is Virga the same as rhyme? No, Virga is so Virga basically is the, the precipitation that evaporates before it reaches the ground. If you're ever watching a cloud, 
you'll see it come over. It looks like it's raining, and especially here in the West, we see a lot of that, and then it never, never quite reaches the ground. So it evaporates as it falls. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. I'm interested. I'm also really curious. Thank you for asking that. We'll 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 look at that and get back to you. And then Marty was wondering about uh, with frost. He noticed a similar phenomenon that uh, involves the formation of crystals rather than melting of them. Um, does it similarly relate to the humidity and elevation as far as frost goes? And you may not you may not know some of these the answers to some of these. And we can we can always follow up with. Uh, with the, with the viewers yeah. on those. Yeah, my, I think I filed it away somewhere in my little mental file that um, sublimination happens more readily at lower, lower humidity. Is that right, Henry? I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm reading the next question. I didn't hear what you said, I'm sorry. So is it is it correct that sublimination happens more readily in lower humidity as well? Is that it, what he's asking? It should, yeah, it, it should. That, that's that's yeah. right. Yeah, I, I think I'd encountered that, but yeah, happy to happy to look into that one more as well. Okay, and if you could put the map back up with the regions, mm -hmm. uh, specifically, the person was interested in the Great Basin. Sure. Uh, right? There we go. So there's looking at uh, the different regions where where things are being being measured there. I yeah, think so, that other map was better of the entire helpful? United States. It had all the regions for all the U.S. And I, that might have been where you had that. Was that where the dot in Greece was too? Oh, here. There, there. Yeah, here. <laughs> yes. Whoops. What am I? Here we go. Yeah. So the um, these ecoregions are defined um, based on ultimately what defines what drives the differences in these ecoregions is is precipitation but temperature obviously plays into what ecosystems thrive elevation as well as geologic factors um, so that's why we have such a, a big difference in colors across the the continent here okay well we're gonna we're gonna uh wind it up for today again we appreciate you coming on and uh, answering these questions we have a few more if you could take those off off uh, camera here and follow up with folks that'd be great so again thank you megan this is a very interesting project we're looking forward to uh, seeing some of the results from it as well so uh henry thanks. real quick here this is yeah. noah um for those of you who did not get your questions answered um please fill that out on the survey afterwards and that will be the best way for megan to be able to get back to you we have sometimes lost the chat or the the question and answer logs through zoom so it's much better to relay your your unanswered question on the follow-up survey right as we end the webinar thanks noah appreciate that well well again thank you megan appreciate you being with us today um as we close out today's program, we want to let you know that our next Weather Talk webinar will be taking place on Thursday, May 12th, so almost two months from today. And uh, that will be with uh, Eric uh, Skylingstad of Oregon State University. He's going to explore the subject of air and sea interactions in the coastal zone. So that's a, a topic we haven't touched on before. You won't want to miss this one. We'll have the registration info up on our website shortly. And before I forget, as Noah mentioned, before signing off today, please take that short survey as it pops up on your screen. Uh, well, until we meet again, stay safe and healthy. Uh, this is Henry Regis for the rest of the Coco Ross team saying goodbye for now and wishing each of you a wonderful week ahead. Take care.